Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you and I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Somebody say, I will be with you. I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt to you for your ransom, Cush and Sheba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid. Somebody say, don't be afraid. afraid. For I am with you. Somebody say, the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. And I will say to the north, give them up. I will say to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and have made, lead those out who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All nations will gather together and the peoples will assemble. Which of them, hallelujah, foretold this and proclaimed this to us, the former things? Let them bring mm, in their witness to prove we are right so that others may hear and say it is true. I want you to notice this. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be any other after me, for I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior." I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I am not some foreign God among you, but you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, For your sake, I send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians. How many know when the word talks about Babylon, the Lord's talking about witchcraft and sorcery and divination and the things the enemy tries to bring against God's people? How many are hearing this this morning? I declare even as I'm reading this, God is breaking things that are coming against this house. For the Lord says, for your sake. Woo. I'm going to start back in verse 14. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake, I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitive all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. For I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord said, who made a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters who drew out the chariots and horses and army and reinforcements together. And they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wind. Forget the former things. Oh, this is for so many people. God's just speaking this to them right now. Forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Thank you, Lord. We receive this. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen people, I form for myself that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not you have not wearied yourselves for me, O Israel. You have not brought me sleep for burnt off sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for increase. You have not brought any fragrant calamus to me, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices. But you've burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. 
Review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case for your innocence. Ah, your first father sinned. Your spokesman rebelled against me. So I will disgrace the dignitaries of your temple and I will consign Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. Now, how many know even though that chapter ends a little rough, what's the heart of the Lord? You are mine and I am with you. I've called you by name. It's time to forget the past. And it's time to lay hold of me and what I'm doing right now. Amen. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, we bless your name this morning. We just love you on this Mother's Day. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you that you're a father to the fatherless. You're a mother to the motherless. And Lord, the word says that you put lonely in families. Lord, we love you this morning. Lord Jesus, I speak a blessing right now over our mothers in this house. Lord, I thank you for the moms, the spiritual moms, the grandmothers in this house. We rise up and bless them right now. Lord, you said in your word, your children will rise up and call you blessed. Lord, we just bless the moms in this house right now. And we speak life over them in Jesus' name. And Lord, we declare the latter glory is going to be so much greater greater than the former glory in the lives of our moms, Lord God. Lord Jesus, we declare over them as men in this congregation that this is their breakthrough year. And Lord, you're going to do things in them this year greater than the years past. For the latter glory will be so much greater than the former glory. And Lord Jesus, we decree and declare in this house you're the God of restoration. And Lord, even as this word is being released today, Lord, may you release your your anointing of restoration in this house. May you restore back to us what the enemy has stolen, what the locusts and cankerworm have eaten. May you release your glory on this house. And Lord Jesus, we ask that your power and your presence and your anointing would invade this place and every home where this word is going to be heard. May your blessing fall upon that place. And Lord Jesus, we declare you're doing a new thing in this house. Lord, may the old thing just be washed away by your blood right now. And may you release a new thing in this house in you. And Lord Jesus, we pray this in your precious name. For you are the God who restores. You're the God who saves. You're the God who heals. When we go through the fire, we won't be burned. When we go through the floodwaters, we won't be drowned. For you are with us. You said, don't be discouraged, don't be dismayed, don't be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Lord Jesus, I declare in your name, this house is going places! Hallelujah! And Lord, you're going with us. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. In Jesus' name we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of the Father. For how many know, church, the word says, there's no other name under heaven given to men by which they may be saved but the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. How many need some encouragement in the Lord this morning? Yes. Oh, I don't think you heard me. How many need some encouragement in the Lord this morning? Oh, hallelujah. If you need some encouragement today, has the Lord got a word for you? Hallelujah. The title of the word today is, I'm bringing restoration. I'm bringing restoration. The Lord says he's bringing restoration over this house. And if you're a part of this house, the Lord says, I'm bringing restoration over you. How many received that word in Jesus' name? Amen. If you've got the word with you this morning, let's go to Joel chapter 2. And I want to thank so many people for coming out on Mother's Day. Hallelujah. You bless the Father as you came out on Mother's Day today. And so I'm just so excited that you're here this morning. How many are ready to receive? Yes. Amen. I need you to help me with this this morning. Faith comes by hearing. and hearing by the word, the word of God. Amen. So how many are here ready to hear the word of God? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody say he's the God of restoration. He's God. God, of restoration. God wants you to receive that today. He's the God of restoration. When you have Joel chapter 2 verse 25, I want you to stand up. 
We're going to start out looking at in verses 25 and 26. And I just declare breakthrough over this house right now. I just declare restoration over this house. I declare everything the Lord just had us release in Isaiah 41 is coming forth over this house right now. Amen? All right. The Lord says in Joel chapter 2 and verse 25, the Lord says, I will repay you. <laughs> Who's going to repay you? The Lord says, I'm going to repay you. The Lord says, the enemy's not going to repay you. You don't want payment back from the enemy. You want the Lord to repay you. Can I hear an amen? amen. Hallelujah. He said, I am the Lord your God. I've redeemed you and I've called you by name. He said, I will repay you for the days. <laughs> what does the word say? I will repay you for the years. I will repay you for the years. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locusts and the young locusts and the other locusts and the locust swarm. Mm. I want you to notice something. Four different groups of locusts are mentioned here. How many know the Lord could have just said, I'm going to pay you back for what the locusts have eaten. But the Lord goes into detail and he mentions four different types of locusts. Notice this. He says what the locusts have eaten, the great locusts, the young locusts, other locusts, and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent amongst you. We need to understand this this morning. There's not just one type of locust. If you study locusts, there are different type of locust specialists. And when the locusts come through to strip something bare, there's one type of locust that goes after the roots of the tree. There's another type that goes after the trunk of the tree. There's another type that goes after the leaves on the tree. And there's yet another type that destroys the fruit of the tree. And yet, anyone ever went through that season where four different types of locusts came? And I tell you what, church, by the time those four types of locusts come through, there's nothing left. There's nothing left. So how many know the Lord don't went into detail on purpose here? He's saying there's nothing that's been stripped away by the enemy that I am not going to restore back to you. The latter glory will be so much greater than the former glory in your life. How many received that? And then the Lord said in verse 26, and you will have plenty to eat until you're full and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you and never again will my people be shamed. Hallelujah. Notice verse 27, and then you will know that I am in Israel and that I am the Lord your God and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Please be seated this morning. Now, if any of you recognize that, you've been hearing me claim Isaiah 61 over this house over and over and over again. The Lord says in Isaiah 61, 7, he says, instead of shame, my people will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in the land and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice and I hate robbery and iniquity. And in my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. How many receive what the Lord is saying this morning? Amen. I want us to understand something in the Lord this morning. There are some difficult times that lie ahead. And that is why the Lord is saying to the church right now, I want you to press into the secret place. The Lord says, I want you like the five wise virgins to press into the secret place with me and cultivate the oil of intimacy because there's things I need to show you. There's things I need to deliver you from. There's areas of your life where I need to heal you. There's a place where I need to take you that you're only going to access through the secret place that's going to prepare you for what is coming. And the Lord says, if we say right now, like those who are invited to the wedding feast, if we say, I'm too busy, or I've just bought this property, or I've just done this, or I just started seeing this person, the Lord says, we're going to miss out on some amazing things that God's about to do. 
So what is the Lord saying to you right now? The Lord says, I want to strip away. Isn't it interesting? In Joel chapter 2, the locusts came and they stripped everything. How many know when everything gets stripped, all that's left is the one thing? Because no matter what the locusts eat, the one thing can never be taken from us. So the Lord says, I want you to return back to your first love. I want you to return back to me because I need to do some things in you because the time is coming that's going to be very difficult where a lot of things are going to be stripped away. But the Lord says, if I'm your first love and I'm your one thing, even when things get stripped away, you've lost nothing because you still have me. And the Lord says, and then your love will not wax cold and you're not going to fall away because the things that you trusted in have been taken away. How they know the Lord Jesus is jealous for the affection of his church and he's wanting his church to press in deep into his intimate heart in this hour. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Okay, let, let me say that again. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Amen. All right. So let's go back to Joel chapter 2. It's interesting that there's not a whole lot that's known about Joel other than his namesake. We don't hear him mentioned other than in the book of Joel and then when he's quoted again by Peter in the book of Acts. But how many know that he released a prophetic word in Joel chapter 2 that's being fulfilled in three different generations? I believe Joel chapter 2 was fulfilled in the day of Joel. I believe that it was fulfilled when Jesus came the first time. And I believe before the Lord returns again that the Lord Jesus, hallelujah, is going to release the final and greatest fulfillment of Joel chapter 2 in the earth. Every time that prophetic threefold word is released by the Lord, it's released in increasing measure which is a picture of what God wants to do in your life. He says, I want to begin to release things in your life in increasing measure. We've got to understand that. God says, I want more, and I want to give you more of me than you've ever had before. Amen. How many received that? Amen. Amen. All we know about Joel is this. If you study the book of Joel, we just know his father's name, and we know his name, and that's about all that we know about him. The word says his father was Pentheel, and his father's name literally means the mouth of God. Isn't it interesting that a father brought forth a prophetic son, and that father's name meant the mouth of God? And Joel's name means the Lord is God. We can also put it this way. His name can also mean who is like the Lord. So isn't this incredible? This guy whose name means the mouth of God has a prophetic son whose name means that our God is the Lord. How many receive that? Or the Lord is God. Now, if you ever have time to study the book of Joel, you're going to find three things about the book. It's broken down into three chapters. The first chapter is about ruin and destruction. It's locusts coming in. They're eating the crops. They're destroying everything. The land is being judged by the Lord. Why is the land being judged by the Lord? Because of idolatry, because of wickedness. The land is being judged by God because men are doing things is people that grieve the heart of God. And so what does the Lord do? The Lord allows destruction to take place in the land. Let me ask you a question. How many are glad the book of Joel is not one chapter? Amen. Amen? Amen. Because whenever there's destruction, there's a God reset that happens. Whenever God takes things back to ground zero, his heart is always restoration. Oh, yeah. Because when we get into chapter 2, after there's been ruin and destruction and despair, chapter 2 is all about restoration. And the Lord says, I'm going to restore the years back to you, the crops back to you, and the joy back to you. Amen. I've got a word from the Lord this morning for some people in this house and some people listening in. The Lord says, you've gone through Joel chapter 1. For some of you, God says, your entire life has felt like Joel chapter 1. But the Lord says, you're crossing out of chapter 1 and you're coming into chapter 2. Amen. How many received that in the Lord? Amen. He said, I'm going to restore the years, the crops, the joy that's been taken from you. He says, I'm going to redeem the time. 
I keep hearing God say this for this house and people in this house. I'm going to redeem the time. And people have come to me and said, Pastor, what does it mean to redeem when God redeems the time? It means when God redeems the time, it's not that he takes you back to that time and you relive it and you're able to do some things right that you did wrong and receive some things back that were stolen. The Lord says, when I redeem the time, I go back to that time period where everything went awry and through my anointing and my healing and my restoration, I make it as if you did the things you were supposed to do in that time so that as you're here in this place in the timeline, I can take what you should have received back here and bring it to you now how many receive that in the Lord and the Lord says you're going to catch up to where you should be right now in the timeline what does the word say he sees the end from the beginning he said I'm going to take what you missed there and I'm going to bring it to where you're standing at in the timeline right now that's how he redeems the years that's how he redeems the time. But the Lord says, I want you to believe that I'm the God who can redeem the time, that I can restore what the locusts and cankworm have eaten. Let it be unto you according to your faith. Amen. And the Lord says, I want you to begin to believe that I'm the God of the impossible. Yes. Come on. And he says, my people are about to begin to believe what they've known. How many receive that? Amen. The Lord says, my people, as they press in the secret place, are going to go from quoting things and saying things like, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. The Lord is saying, you're going to go from saying that I'm good to knowing I am good. Yes. You know, how many know that's two different things completely? Yes. Yes. Amen. The Lord said, you will know me and I will know you. So Joel chapter 1 is all about ruin and destruction, insects, locusts, cankerworm, all these stuff attacking Israel. Joel chapter 2 is about restoration. And then Joel chapter 3 talks about the revival that God is releasing as he this comes on the heels of God releasing restoration over the land. God says, I am reviving things. Thank you. See, we've got to understand about what's about to happen. We're about to see things happen in the earth that are going to be shocking. All you need to do right now is just take a look at what's going on in the news regarding what's going on in Ukraine, what they fear is going to go on in Taiwan, and you're going to begin to realize that very quickly the world as we know it can change. Okay, Even 2019, if I was telling you, you know what? Our, the world we know is going to change. There's, there's going to be a, a virus that's going to come through. There's going to be a pandemic. There's going to be supply chain issues. Gas is going to go up to almost $5 a gallon. You're going to see no toilet paper on the shelves, all this. You'd have been like, Pastor, come on. Come, come on, Pastor. You, you've been filling up the communion tray again, haven't you? <laughs> I, I, come on now, Pastor. But you know what? Have we not lived through something that we thought we'd never see in our lifetimes? And guys, I'm telling you what, the Lord is saying we are not far from something happening that shocks us and we're saying, I can't believe that just happened. And before we can complete the sentence, something else happens and then something else happens and then something else happens. There's going to be a series of boom, boom, boom. Things that are going to happen, they're going to shake the earth. But how many know the Lord didn't hide it? He said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken until only that that cannot be shaken remains. And that that cannot be shaken is that that's built upon the Lord Jesus. How many receive that right now? So the Lord says, if my people will get into the secret place during the shaking, they will not be shaken. And the Lord says, even as things happen that we're shocked that are going to happen in our lifetime, the Lord says, it will be as if my people are living in the land of Goshen. While all these things are happening. But I'm telling you what, we have to go through to get to that place, the book of Joel. What are you talking about, Pastor? We've got to go through a time where God allows the things to be eaten away in our lives that are not of Him. Come on. How many receive that? And that's why right now, Holy Spirit's saying, I don't want you to do this anymore. I don't want you to watch this anymore. I don't want you to partake in this anymore. I don't want you to go here anymore. I don't want you to talk like this anymore. And if we're not careful, our heart before the Holy Spirit, and how many know our God knows all things? 
Yes. Right? Who knows the heart of a man other than the spirit of the man? Who knows the heart of God other than the spirit of God? <laughs> Holy Spirit knows. And if we're not careful, our attitude can be like, well, God, you didn't care about that in previous seasons. And the Lord is saying to you, you're coming into a season like you've never been in before. Yeah. That's why I'm pruning, I'm clipping, I'm, I'm letting things be eaten away, I'm removing, I'm separating things from you. For some of us, I'm even separating people from you. Amen. They can't be in your lives anymore because they're going to hold you back in this season I'm bringing you into. Right now, as God's people are pressing into the secret place, the locusts are coming but God is sending the locusts Amen. to eat everything away that needs to be eaten away. So when that happens, don't go, God, why are you doing this to me? Don't, don't go, well, God, why are you letting the enemy do this? Well, God, I thought I had a hedge of protection. Pastor Andrew told me to pray Psalm 91 every day. God, why is this happening? You know what? God is working all things together for good in your life according to his purpose because you're his and he's called you by name. How many received that in the Lord? The Lord says, stop questioning and start listening. I don't think you heard that. Because hold, I just heard Holy Spirit say that. He said, in the things that are coming in your life, stop questioning and start listening. Because before you ever ask the why, I'm already releasing the answer to you. And for many right now, locusts are eating things up and they're going, God rebuke the devil and God's going, I'm doing it. <laughs> There's a time in our walk with the Lord where if we won't listen to the Lord and won't do it His way, He'll send in the locusts if He has to. And He sends them in love. You look in the book of Joel and the Lord starts talking about my army, my army, my army. How many know the Lord is in charge of the armies? But God never sends in the locusts to eat things up and to deal with those things. God never sends the locusts, we've got to understand this church, without wanting to bring the restoration. The eating away and the stripping away opens up the door for God to deal with things and bring the restoration that God wants to bring. How many received that? Yes. In church, after restoration, He brings revival. Yes. See, we've got to understand there's a godly progression here. How many know the Lord loves to work in threes? We've got to understand that the Lord is saying right now we're in the morning of the third day and the Lord is coming soon. And the Lord says right now in my people's lives, hallelujah, I'm tearing things down so that I can restore things back my way so that I can bring revival. Folks, it's happening in the church first and then it's going to happen in the earth. Why does it happen in the church first? Because judgment begins with the house of God. Yes, amen. See, it always has to happen with the church first because the church is supposed to lead the world in everything. Yes, yes. The day is coming where God is going to take the arts over and give the true arts back to the church and the church is going to lead the world in the arts. Yes, amen. See, we've got to understand that and the artistry of the third heaven is going to begin to be released through God's people, the church, and the world is going to begin to follow instead of the church following the world. See, God is bringing everything back to his order, and as he, if he has to bring the locust to do it, he'll do it. Now, I want to be honest with you. If we will do what God says when he asks us to do it, he doesn't have to send the locust. Some of us need the locust. I believe in that. He's teaching us to be obedient. Jesus said in the Gospels, he said, if you love me, You'll obey my commands. God's working to get some of our love for him in the right place. Okay? This is just a word from the Lord. Anybody receive that? Yes. Amen. Please still love me when we're done with this word. He's preaching to me too. How many receive that in the Lord? Yes. It's very interesting that when we look at the word of God, there's three major themes that we see going on all over the word of God. And it's important for us to understand that. It's salvation deliverance and restoration mm -hmm. salvation deliverance and restoration but you know what always seems to precede those three things bondage mm -hmm. bondage and many times bondage comes because we don't say yes to the Lord and do the things that he asks us to do 
Many times bondage comes because we don't listen and surrender to the Lord. How many are receiving what the Lord is saying right now? Yes. But the Lord's heart is not to lead us or leave us in a place of bondage. Look at the book of Judges. I'm in the book of Judges right now as I'm reading through the word again. And in the book of Judges, what happened? God would raise up a deliverer and the deliverer would liberate Israel and there would be revival and restoration and peace. And then what would happen after the deliverer died? Israel would sin and they'd go up in the high places and they would open up the door. Their actions opened up the door for tormenting spirits to come in. For spirits of bondage to come in. So they'd live in that bondage, sometimes 20 years, sometimes 40 years. And when the bondage became too much for them, they finally cried out to the Lord. And the Lord would hear. The Lord would bring salvation. God would bring deliverance. God would bring restoration until that judge died. And then they would go back through the same cycle. In the book of, jo in the book of Judges, we see it happen over and over and over and over and over again. Let me ask you a question. How many have lived in the book of Judges? But God says, I'm raising up my people to walk in a place of victory now. Amen. I'm raising up my people to walk in a place of overcoming. How many receive that? Yeah. But we got to understand something, folks. There's some difficult things that are coming. Amen. Okay, now we've got a delayed amen. There's some <laughs> difficult things that are coming. God is trying to prepare our heart for that. Where things were going along seemingly well, then all of a sudden the locust hit. Come on. And then all of a sudden, God brought forth in their life then breakthrough and restoration and then revival. We see it in the life of, jo of Joseph, in the life of Jacob, in the life of Job, in the life of Esther. Many times there's a very difficult locust-laden season, but that season is going to open up the door for restoration and revival. Amen. Huh. So if you're, if you're in that season right now where the locusts have been swarming, you know what God is saying? Look up to the heavens. Look into my eyes. The Lord is saying, look into the hills from where your help comes from. Your help comes from the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. He who watches over you doesn't slumber. He who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord is saying, get ready because redemption draweth nigh. How many are excited in the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. So over and over again, we see this in the word. Sin leading to repentance. Bondage, then deliverance. Failure, then restoration. And I tell you what, church, if we as God's people don't believe that we serve the God of restoration, we're missing one of the most powerful messages in the word of God. Okay, let me say that again. If we don't believe as God's people that our God is the God of restoration, we're missing one of the most powerful messages in the Word of God. Amen. But God wants to set His people free from bitter root judgments. Because God can be restoring and renewing and bringing revival all around you, and it can seem like it's not happening in your life. And if there's a bitter root judgment that's come through the family line or a bitter root judgment that started with you because things happen in your life in a manner that you didn't think they were going to happen and you find yourself in a place where you didn't think you'd be at this point in your life, if you're not careful, you can have a bitter root judgment that goes deep within you that says something like this. You know God does that. He does it for everybody but... Mm-hmm. I like the fact that you didn't give me the last word on that. You've been listening well. But if we're not careful, we can begin to have the attitude that God does it for everybody but me. And how do you know that's an orphan's heart? Yes. The orphan heart of or the orphan spirit will cause you to feel like you're on the outside looking in. 
and there's something wrong with you and that's why these things don't happen. The Lord says there's nothing wrong with you, but there are some things I want to heal you from, deliver you from, set you free from, because just as you're seeing me bring restoration and revival in other people's lives, the Lord says, I have the same for you, yes. for you are mine. Yes. Yes. How many received this word from the Lord? Yes. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe that our God is the God of restoration? Amen. Anybody remember Job? So Job's in the midst of all this difficulty, and his wife, who's probably the closest relationship he has, you know, physically, in the flesh, other than his relationship that he has with the Lord, and as he's sitting on top of the heap, right, the, the, the pile of broken pottery, and he's scraping his boils to scrape the fluid out of his boils, four swarms of locusts have come, so to speak. How many are getting this? Four swarms of locusts. One attacked the root of the tree, the other the trunk, the next the leaves, and then the fruit. Four different messengers. What is Job's response? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes, amen. God wants to prepare us for the time as things grow darker, that if even things are stripped away from us that are near and dear, that our hearts cry can be, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Quiet amens on that one. See, the Lord says, I want to get your heart in the right place, and it's the secret place. The Lord says, I want to get your heart in the right place. Return to your first love. Isn't that what he said to the, the, the church in the book of Revelation? In chapters 2 and 3, he said to one of the churches, he says, I have this against you. You've departed from your first love. The Lord says, return to me, return to me, return to me. That's what God is saying to the church right now. Return to me, return to me, return to me. That's the heart of the lovesick God crying out to his church right now. Return to me, return to me, return to me. I see what's coming and I want to prepare you in the place of intimacy for what you're about to see so that you won't waver when things happen that are going to cover and affect the entire earth. So when things are moved, you won't be moved. How many receive that? Amen. Okay. The problem is if we have an orphan spirit, this is our heart. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. That's just the way it is. Is anybody hearing what the Holy Spirit's saying? The Lord says, I want you to know me and to know I give and I take away, but I'm a good God. Yes. And I'm a good father that gives good gifts. And sometimes I take things away that you don't understand in that season why I had to take it. But seasons down the road, you're going to understand. And you're going to say that I'm a good, good father and I, I give good gifts. Amen. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. So if we're going to believe that our God is the God of restoration, we've got to understand what restoration really is. Because I understand right now if I hand out a slip of paper to everybody that's hearing this word and those that are online hearing the word, and I said, define restoration. How many different definitions of restoration do you think I'd get? As many slips of paper as I handed out would, would be, right? The number of different definitions of restoration. So how many know the way we define something doesn't necessarily matter the way God does? That's what really matters. And the Lord says, I want to begin to define things in your life. Because the way I see things is the right way to see things. Because my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth are my ways than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. And the Lord has said, for generations, my church has wanted me to come into alignment with them. The Lord says, I'm the Lord your God, and there is no other God beside me. The Lord says, you come into alignment with me. Yes, amen. How many receive that? Yes. And God is saying, stop standing outside of the shower with the water on, because you're not going to get wet there. Get underneath the shower head. Come on. The Lord says, my ways are higher than your ways. How well have your ways been working out for you? The Lord says, I want you to surrender to my ways. I want my church to follow me. I don't want to have to follow after my church to chase them and pursue them. You've heard me say this before. About a decade ago, the Lord says, for generations I've chased my bride. Now I want her to chase me. 
Who? Amen. To kiss the face of the God of Jacob. How many received that? Yes. Amen. Okay. It's very, very interesting that the word restore is used 136 times in the Bible. 136 times in the Bible. What does that mean? Restoration is a major theme in the word. The only other theme that really overtakes restoration is salvation and deliverance. And there's a pattern there. God says, I bring salvation, I bring deliverance, then I bring restoration. How many receive that godly progression? Yes. Okay. Now the word in Hebrew for restoration is spelled A-U-R-K-A-H. Arka. Arka is how you pronounce that word. And are you ready for this? In the Hebrew, the majority of the times the word restoration is used, this is what it means. Complete healing or restoration in abundance better than it was before. Yes. Amen. Let me say this again. Arka, A-U-R-K-A-H, complete healing or restoration in abundance better than it was before. Amen. Now, it's interesting if you go back to the Hebrew root. The Hebrew root for the word restoration is the same Hebrew root for the word salvation. I just want to point that out. The Greek contemporary to that would be sozo. And you know what sozo means? Sozo means complete healing, wholeness, and restoration in your body, in your finances, in your relationship, in your marriage, in every part of your life. We look at salvation this way, especially if we have a Baptist background. Salvation is the time I went down the aisle and I got on my knees and I asked Jesus to come into my heart and my name was in the book of life and the angels rejoiced. That's salvation. That's a one-dimensional view of a three-dimensional word. The Lord says salvation is not an event. Salvation is a lifestyle. And the Lord says when you're saved... It's so much more than your name being written in the book of life. I want to release so-so over you. Total restoration, healing in your body, in your finances, in your marriage, in your family, in your relationships, in your soul. So don't look at restoration, salvation, and deliverance one-dimensionally. They're ongoing, not one-time events. Even salvation itself. I'm saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. Yes. See, we've got to understand this in the Lord. A lot of things that God does, guys, I'm going to be honest with you, are processes. Amen. We like one and done. <laughs> okay? I mean, there's, there's coffee drinkers in this house. We, we pulled out the old Baptist coffee maker back there, which is large, round, and tall. All right? So Holly, Holly you know, gets that now. And, and the wonderful thing about that coffee in the back of the room right now is if you get a hankering for some coffee, hankering's a Missouri term, if you get a hankering for some coffee, you just go back there. It's hot. It's fresh. It's in the cup. You doctor it up, and you're ready to go. But how many know before most folks got here, Holly took the pot, she filled it with water, right? She lined it with a filter, she put the coffee in there, and then the coffee had to brew. You're enjoying the end result. The problem is, as a society, we have a microwave mindset. Put it in the microwave in a matter of minutes, it's hot, fresh, and ready to go. And then we take that microwave mentality before God, and he's not a God who microwaves, he's a God who crockpots. How many receive that? And the Lord says, I want my people to stop walking in a microwave mentality. Almost everything I do is a process. And God says, I want to teach you how to walk out the process beginning, middle, and end. He says that's part of maturity. So arka in the Hebrew means complete healing, restoration and abundance, better than it was before. God says, I want to bring restoration in your life. I want to make it better than it was before. Which means you get sick. God wants to heal your body and make it better than it was before. Amen. Some, that something was stolen from you, God says, I not only want you to get the principle back, I want you to get interest with it. Amen. 
God says a ministry was pulled for you. I want to not only give you that ministry, but I want to give you the increase of it too. How many receive that in the Lord? But it comes down to the concept of how do we see God? Do we see the God as a God who brings increase or do we see God as a God who takes things away? Do we have an orphan's heart or the heart of a son? How many are receiving what the Lord is saying right now? Yes, now it's interesting that word Archa. Does that remind anybody of a name of God? Archa Rapha. Does that sound familiar to anybody? The name Jehovah Rapha doesn't just mean the God who heals. Rapha also means the God who restores. How many received that? Amen. It also means the God who restores. So when we say to him, you're Jehovah Rapha, I need you to heal my body. He's saying, he, the Lord says back to us, I not only want to heal your body, I want to make it better than it was before. Yes. See, how do we see God? Do we see him as a God that just heals? Or a God that heals and makes it better than it was before. Amen. Does anybody remember a captain by the name of, of Naaman? And Naaman goes to the prophet because he has leprosy. And as he goes to the prophet because he has leprosy, the prophet sends through a servant, go and dip in the Jordan River seven times. Amen. And so he goes and dips in the Jordan River seven times, seven the Hebrew number of completion. And when he comes up the seventh time, the Lord said his skin was healed. No more leprosy. Yes. But if our God is Jehovah Rapha, he not only heals and restores, then the Lord says, and his skin was like that of a child. Yes. <laughs> How many know that middle-aged man came out of there with skin like a child? That's healing and restoration. Yes. The Lord says, don't see me one-dimensionally. I don't just heal, I heal and I restore. Does he not, guys? He says, I heal and I restore. I make it better than it ever was. Hallelujah! How many are excited in the Lord? See, we've got to understand that. So I want you to get this in the Lord. Remember as we were reading in Isaiah 41... What did, there's 43 a moment ago. What did the Lord say? He said, forget the former things that lie behind. He said, I, I'm doing a new thing. How many received that? Amen. He said, I, I'm doing a new thing. Now hold on to that, and I want you to hear this. Whenever sin, failure, and defeat take place in our lives, God's heart is not to bring condemnation. His heart is to bring restoration. Amen. How do we see God? Is he a God of grace or a God of anger? Is he a God of judgment or is he a God of mercy? Here's the answer to that. Yes. Yes. But his heart is never to have to bring judgment on his people. His heart is to be able to bring mercy. That's why he said, I desire mercy over judgment. But if we don't listen and we don't do what God says then the loving father has to discipline the sons that he loves. Mm -hmm. And he only disciplines to get us back in the right place so he can restore and bless us. Amen. How many are catching this? Amen. He said, you're going to walk as the head and not the tail, Amen. above and not beneath. And the Lord says, with me, you can't lose. <laughs> see, but how do we see God? And God says, I'm wanting to get at the images of the way my people see me. Because the Lord says, many times my people don't see me for who I really am. They see me through the lens of how they grew up. They see me through the lens of the religious and denominational. They see me in so many ways, but they don't see me. This is one of the reasons why the Lord says, I want my people to get into the secret place. Because God's going to give us true revelation of who he is. Amen. And as and, and don't look at him one dimensionally, guys. As he gives us a true revelation of who he is, then he's going to give us a true revelation of who we are in him. So gentlemen, who, who do men say that I am? Well, some say John the Baptist and some say Elijah and, and some say the prophet or this, that or the other thing. Okay, well, who do you say that I am? 
most important question we'll ever answer in our lifetime. Who do we say that Jesus is? And Simon Peter finally gets the boot out of his mouth. And what does he say? He says, you're the son of God. You came to die. You know, take away the sins of the world. You're Yeshua. You're Messiah. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not given to you by man, but by my father in heaven. If he stopped right there, he got an amazing revelation of who Jesus was. But then Jesus said, but I tell you this, your name is Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Does anybody get this? Peter gets a revelation of who Jesus is. Then Jesus gives him a revelation of who he is. Is anybody getting that? That's why the Lord says it's so important to press in, because I'm going to tell you who you are. Are. Can I hear an amen? amen? See, we've got to understand this in the Lord. God is good. That's his nature. And his heart is not to condemn. His heart is to heal. Amen. How many know even on that day when Jesus throws people in the pit of hell, it's really not Jesus doing it. Their decision did it. Amen. And I believe the toughest day of Jesus' existence is yet ahead because on that day, he's going to have to say to people that he desperately loves, depart from me, I never knew you. Yes. And that word K-N-E-W in the Greek means relationship. It means intimacy. Mm -hmm. How many Amen. receive that? Amen. I mean, he's going to grieve as that happens, but then the time will come and he wipes the tear from every eye. I think it's best to let him wipe the tear from our eyes now as he deals with things in us. Yeah. How many received that? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we've got to understand, even as we study Israel, when difficult things happen, God always brought salvation, deliverance, and restoration. Israel is in Babylonian captivity. God sends two men. He sends, he sends Ezra and Nehemiah as they're coming out and going back into the promised land. Ezra's name in the Hebrew means God helps or God protects. What does God use Ezra to do? To bring back the restoration of the spiritual in Israel. Then God brings Nehemiah, and Nehemiah's name means God comforts. And what was Nehemiah to do? To rebuild the walls and the gates. This is prophetic. Don't tune out on me on this because this is prophetic. Israel goes into captivity. Why? Because God just didn't like Israel? No, they were the apple of his eye, but they were idolatrous, they were adulterous, mm -hmm. right? And God sent the prophets and they prophesied and they wouldn't listen, so God sent Nebuchadnezzar. But God's heart, even as they went into captivity, was restoration. Mm -hmm. Because he knew captivity would bring repentance which will allow him to bring salvation, deliverance, and restoration. We see it all through the word of God. So they get sent back into the promised land then, but they don't know what they're supposed to do. God sends Ezra the priest to teach them how to serve God again because they're 70 years removed from Israel and who knows how many generations prior to that not even serving God in Israel. So Ezra brings spiritual restoration but then God brings Nehemiah to rebuild the walls and the gates. Grab a hold of this, guys. When we go through a season where we make bad decisions and it brings bondage and difficult things begin to happen, the Lord God says, I want to touch you. I want to heal you. I want to restore you. I want to deliver you. How many receive that? Yes, amen. Then God says, as that's happening, I'm sending in Ezra because I'm going to bring spiritual restoration to your life. Then I'm sending in Nehemiah because you can be spiritually restored, but when you fell, when difficult things happened, when you stepped away, when the locusts came, your walls and your gates were torn down. And I want to restore the walls and gates of protection around you. If we really study the soul and deliverance, there's a lot of people walking around that don't have godly walls of protection around them and their gates are wide open and the enemy can come in and out. God says, I want to send Ezra and I want to send Nehemiah. How many received this word? Amen. When Israel was captive in Egypt, God sent two men. Here we go again, Moses and Aaron. Moses' name in Hebrew meant to draw out. 
Aaron's name meant God is exalted. God wanted to use Aaron to teach them things about who God was to help restore them back to Jehovah after 400 years of darkness. And God wanted to use Moses to teach them how to war, how to fight, and how to be victorious. How many are receiving what God's saying? God says, as since Ezra and Nehemiah, God says Moses and Aaron. And in both situations, when we look at the Babylonian captivity, when we look at the Egyptian captivity, God's doing the same thing. Taking his people from being slaves to sons to soldiers. Amen. God says, I want to teach my people how to go from being slaves to being sons. To learn how to go from being sons to being soldiers. So in Egypt, slaves. In the wilderness, God's doing miracles and revealing himself. And the glory is falling on the, the tabernacle. And the glory is up on the mountain. Teaching them how to be sons. Then, going into the promised land, I've got to teach you how to be soldiers. <coughs> God's doing the same thing in your life right now. How many received that? Amen. But I believe you can never be the true soldier for God that you're supposed to be if you don't first realize you're a son. Amen. Because when you come into your sonship, you begin to realize that your God is the mighty warrior God who goes before you. And he's given you a brick in one hand and a sword in the other and anointed you for victory. Amen. But you see, when you're not a son, you don't really know who you are. When you're coming into your sonship, you're getting to know who you are. So God says, I'm going to take you from slaves to from slaves to sons to soldiers. Amen. How do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. Amen. And that's a picture of what God does in the life of the believer. God says, I take you from being a slave to sin and bondage, then into deliverance and salvation into your sonship, and then I teach you how to be good soldiers fighting the fight of good faith. Amen. And by the way, you study the life of Paul, you see that very same thing happen in his life. He was a slave to religion and religious practice, didn't know who the Lord was, meets the Lord on the road. God begins to take him through salvation, deliverance, <laughs> restoration, and then God raises him up as one of the greatest apostolic soldiers in the entire word of God. Amen. <laughs> Brick in one hand and sword in the other, as Nehemiah says. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. All right, let's go to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. How many are enjoying this word on Mother's Day? Amen. All right, and hopefully you're not thinking, wait a minute, it's Mother's Day. Where's a nice Mother's Day word? <laughs> Wrong place. Oh, Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to preach what the Lord gives me. God bless your mama. Hallelujah. But we need a word from the Lord today. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I think that the church doesn't understand God's viewpoint of restoration. And if the church doesn't understand God's viewpoint of restoration, then we don't understand how God wants to work restoration in our lives. No more than we understand then how the church is supposed to help take people through the process of restoration. See, if we don't get out, God sees it. How can we help other people then go through it? How many get this in the Lord? And so God says, I want to not only restore my people, then I want to give them a Rapha anointing so they can be my healing balm and my restorers as I bring the hurting, broken, and wounded into my refuge. Okay. So, how does God view restoration? It's making it better than it was. It was giving you more than what you lost. It's bringing things into his proper balance and viewpoint. And the Lord says, I want you to see that I am Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals and restores. God says you need both. You need me to heal and restore. How many receive that? We, we've got to understand that in the Lord. The Lord says, I'm not the, job, the God who does things halfway. He says, what I start, I finish, and I bring it to completion. How many receive that? Amen. So not only is he the God of restoration, he wants to pour out an anointing of restoration over his people. I've been praying Isaiah 61 over this house almost every day. Because God says, we're to be a house 
that not only walks in restoration, but we can be a house that greets the hurting, the wounded, the broken, the, 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 the devastated and destroyed, the people no one else wants, the legions. And when they come through this door, there's an anointing of restoration in this house. Salvation deliverance, restoration. And the Lord says, if we'll do that in this house, then we're going to go outside of this house and flow in salvation, restoration, and deliverance in other people's lives. Amen. Well, wait a minute. Only Jesus is the Savior. Yes, but Christ in me is the hope of glory. Amen. How do you receive that? Okay, the Lord says, don't forget, I'm the bridegroom, but I'm invading a natural world through my bride. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> He said, don't forget, my word says it brings glory to me, hallelujah, when the Holy Spirit gives to my bride what the Father gave me. Yes. See, we've got to understand this. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And the Lord says, I want you to walk in such an anointing of sonship through an anointing of intimacy with me and such a warfare anointing that no matter what room you go into, you shift the atmosphere. The Lord says, I'm raising up my people to be atmosphere shifters. The Lord says, you will go deep with me in the secret place, but when you walk out of the secret place, the secret place will never leave you. Therefore, when you walk into a place, the secret place goes with, and the atmosphere of your secret place can then fill that room. I was in a room last night in a not-so-great place that Holly and I had been invited to. A whole lot of worldly stuff was going all around us, but we're in this room with a big entrance and what's going on over there. The Spirit of God began to move in that room, and it was like God just put a barrier of His glory at the doorway in the room that I was in with Holly. Folks were getting prayed over and getting touched, and prophetic words were being released, and it was pretty wild. And wait staff were coming in and going back out. And I mean, God was moving in that room. God wants to teach us wherever His people are, wherever the bride is, the bridegroom is also. Last night, I saw Jesus walk in that room. And, and where we've been invited to, and God told us to go. Okay, don't worry, your pastor and his wife didn't fall. We're good. We're real good here. But God told us to go. The Lord said it was one of the places where the scribes, the Pharisees, and the religious people would have said, why is your master in that place? And the Lord said, I, I didn't go for, for, for those that are healthy. I came for the sick. Yes. And the Lord Jesus released an anointing like you'd feel in this house, in that room. Yes. It was amazing what God was doing. And I just said to the folks that were there, I just said, you know what, guys? we got to realize wherever we are, Jesus wants to take the room over. It doesn't matter who's there or where you're at. The Lord Jesus wants to take the room over. When we really begin to come into, come into revelation of that through intimacy and sonship, we begin to walk like Smith Wigglesworth and William H. Branham and Catherine Coleman and other heroes of the faith. And we begin to realize that they don't put on supernatural Levi's every morning. We realize they, they put on the same pantalones that we do. We just begin to realize that they put something else on too. And it was the fragrance of Christ. It was the anointing of intimacy. It was the oil of the wise virgins. How many received that in the Lord? Amen. So I want you to notice something. We've got to first understand what God says restoration is. And the Lord says restoration is complete healing or restoration in abundance, better than it was before. Because then when we go to, to Galatians 6, 1, brothers, if anyone is caught in sin, hmm, you who are spiritual, hmm, who's spiritual in the house? You who are spiritual should restore him gently. Well, everyone here is spiritual. Pastor, we're in church. Huh? Whoa, 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 whoa. The opposite of spiritual is carnal. And churches have spiritual people and carnal people in them. The spiritual are walking according to the spirit. The carnal are walking according to the flesh. So we've got to understand this. So Paul is really saying to the Galatian church, you who are not carnal, you who are walking according to the Spirit should what? Restore him. Restore him. My Bible doesn't say throw him out of the church. My Bible says you should restore him. And how to do it? Well, the two by four of fellowship, of course. No, my Bible says restore him gently. 
or you yourselves may be tempted. Whoa, 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 whoa. So first of all, I need to understand what does God say restoration is? It's archa. Secondly, does God want to bring restoration in my life? Yes, I'm a son and not a slave. Amen? Thirdly, if God wants to bring restoration to my life, then God wants to use me as an instrument of restoration to help restore other people's lives. When this church first started, we had a prophetic word on a Sunday night where the Lord said that this group is going to go into junkyards and restore old cars and make them like new. And then the Lord said, but I'm not talking about cars. Mm -hmm. The Lord said, I'm talking about people. Yes. How many received that? Mm -hmm. And the Lord says, when you go into the junkyard, I'm going to teach you how to see a car in ruins and to see it like I see it for what it can be. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says, when you have a heart for restoration, Legion can come around the foyer during praise and worship. And you don't see Legion, you see a champion for the Lord. Amen. And then you help Legion get to that place. Not with condemnation, but with love and power and anointing. How many received that? Amen. The Lord said, you're going to be my hands and you're going to be my feet. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now it's very interesting, a couple quick things here that Paul says, we've got to understand this. Paul says that whenever we are involved in the process of restoration, because we believe that our God restores, we need to do so in meekness and in humility. Because if we don't, we can find ourselves caught up in a temptation ourselves. Okay, Pastor, what are you trying to say about that? <clears throat> let, let me put it this way. If we, during the process of restoration of the people that God is going to bring into this place, or even with each other, if something happens, if we don't stay in a place of humility and meekness and realize that therefore by the grace of God go I, mm -hmm. but if instead we judge, mm -hmm. I can't believe she did that, I can't believe he did that, that person was in a, a position of leadership, I can't believe they did that, I can't believe they fell for that, I can't believe they had that sin, hidden sin going on and God exposed it, I can't believe, I can't believe, I can't believe, I can't believe, or talked about it and I'll say all this stuff. We are opening up the door for us to fall in a very similar way. Because judgment opens up the door for the tormentors to come. That's why Jesus said, I have forgiven you a debt that you could never repay. Now forgive others. Okay, remember the man? He went before the king. He could never pay the king back. And, and, and the king let him free from all his debts. He walks out of the palace, finds someone who owes him a little bit of money, grabs him by the neck and says, pay me back. He said, I can't. So he turned him over to the tormentors. See, the Lord says, if we don't forgive the way he's forgiven us, we get turned over to the tormentors. So when we go through the process of restoration with someone, we better have humility and meekness because if we don't and we judge them, we can fall in the very same way. Is anybody getting this? Yeah. This is word. Yes. That's why whenever, because God's going to bring people around the corner here, we can't judge, we need to love. Yeah. The Lord Jesus will judge. Okay? We just need to walk into salvation, restoration, deliverance, and healing. Is anybody getting that? That's how we become a refuge. That's how we're a greenhouse and not a slaughterhouse. Yes. Strong word, um, but you're, you can receive that, right? We're mature in the Lord. So what we have to realize is judgment in the house of God can boomerang. Judgment in the house of God can boomerang. Is anybody getting this? That's why we have to do so with humility and meekness. Everybody got it? Yeah. Now it's very interesting. The word says, and I'm reading out the NIV. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, if we go back to the King James Version or, or we go back to even the Hebrew in a linear version, the word says this, he was overtaken in a sin. Now I want us to understand this. What does overtaken mean in the Greek in which Paul was basically writing this? It means to be surprised, to be suddenly invaded, a swift attack. Why can't we judge? Number one, the Lord says, I'm the judge. But number two, God's going to bring some people in here that didn't just willfully surrender to sin. They were overtaken. 
They were blindsided. There was a swift attack. Something just bam hammered them. And they fell. It happens. How many understand this? That's why Jesus looked at the woman who committed the act of adultery. By, by the way, where, where was the man in that scenario? And the religious people say, according to the law, she should die. That's judgment. We're going to have a stoning today. It's been a while. Stoning today. What did Jesus say? Who is without sin cast the first stone? The older folks start dropping the stones first, then the younger, and then they're gone. And Jesus doesn't look at her, and he doesn't go, you dirty, rotten woman. Wow. Nor does he look at her and go, oh, it's okay. Oh, it's, it's, it's okay. No, he looks at her, and I believe in love, in power, and in truth. He said, go away and sin no more. You know what he said to her? You've got a sin problem. It needs to stop. Because if it doesn't, this could take you out. Because next time this happens, I may not be here Amen. to protect you. So in love, he didn't wink at it. God doesn't wink in sin. I don't, I don't subscribe to sloppy grace. He didn't wink. He said, you've got a sin problem. Go and stop. And by the way, this encounter with me should very much help you with this. How many received that? Amen. So we've got to understand this. Sometimes people get overtaken. Sometimes there's generational things that they just don't know how to break free from. Yeah. How many received that? Yeah. And the Lord says, I want you to be a church. That's a church of salvation, deliverance, and restoration, not anger, condemnation, and judgment. And the Lord says, if you'll pursue the oil of intimacy with me in the secret place, I'll teach you how to walk that way. Come on. You know, sometimes the church has people in it that live such a wild and crazy life before they were saved that once they get saved, they feel like, man, I got to keep things under control and I got to be hard on myself and, and I just got to watch everything to the nth degree. And what they don't realize is not only do they do that with themselves, they do that with everybody else too. And that brings forth a place of judgment. How many are getting what God's saying here? Anybody enjoying this word? Amen. 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 So it's interesting. The word says somebody that's overtaken in sin. In the Greek, just like the Hebrew, every word has a picture. Do you know what the, the Hebrew or the Greek word picture of being overtaken is? A rhino fighting with an elephant. I can't make this stuff up. So that word overtaken in the Greek goes back to a rhino fighting an elephant. Okay, well, what does that look like? Well, how many know the elephant is huge, it's strong, it's sturdy, and it has a, a trunk that can kill you? An elephant can swing a trunk and hit a man and break his neck and kill him. But the problem is the rhino has a horn and it's fast. So a rhinoceros and an elephant, and they do get in fights upon occasion, that rhinoceros can run and charge the elephant so quick that it can't get the trunk up and swing it in time. So what happens is the rhino charges the elephant and with that horn hits that elephant and cuts its stomach open with the horn. And then backs away and the elephant... That's a picture in the Greek of someone being overtaken by sin. That rhino rushing in and dealing a death blow. Sometimes that happens to people. Is, is anybody hearing what the Holy Spirit's saying? Sometimes it happens to people. Sometimes generational things are like a rhino charging somebody every day. But how many know the Lord Jesus is the answer? Let me ask that again. How many know the Lord Jesus is the answer? If he did it for me, he can do it for you. Amen? How many receive that in the Lord? So the Lord says, when that person comes around the corner, remember what overtaken means. Overtaken, the Greek, can also be a picture of a ship that's traveling, and all of a sudden a storm comes up out of nowhere and pushes it on the rocks and dashes it to pieces. That's the second Greek picture of what overtaken means. Isn't that interesting? And by the way, guys, we need to understand this for ourselves and for other people. The Lord wants us to know storms can come to break us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. The enemy doesn't fight fair. And I tell you what, you can take this word and start pressing it in the secret place, and all of a sudden the rhinoceros starts charging. 
all of a sudden the winds start blowing. And you're like, Pastor, I'm doing exactly what you said I should do. What's happening? The enemy's taking notice mm -hmm. as much as the Lord is. Yes. And the Lord says, I'm going to teach you how to go from slavery to sonship to being a good soldier of the faith. Mm -hmm. How many get this in the Lord? Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Now, it's interesting that storms come to break us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Sometimes storms come that do all four in one shot. That's all four swarms of locusts. <laughs> Remember, one can come and hit the trunk. One hits the roots. One hits the leaves. One hits the fruit. Sometimes that's what the attack is like. And guys, we need to understand that this is what the word says happens. Daniel 7.25. Daniel 7.25, and I'm going to read this to you out of the Hebrew interlinear version of the word, and I love this, by the way. The word says this, and the word's talking about the enemy at the end of the age. And he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting in the Hebrew... And in there we see it, again, King James Version. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And, uh, and he'll try to change the times and the laws. And it's interesting. That's a whole end time study for the rest of the verse. But it's very interesting that word to wear out literally means emotionally and mentally. To wear you down to where you can't function any longer. Has anybody felt that kind of battle going on lately? I've been battling that in my own life. It's tough enough when you're battling principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places, but, but sometimes actual people come against you mm -hmm. because they have yielded to those things. Mm -hmm. And it can bring an emotional and a mental attack that gets you to the point where you just feel like you can't think. And all of a sudden you're out in public and you can tell the Holy Spirit's highlighting someone, but you can't get through your own mess to hear what Holy Spirit's saying. Mm -hmm. Do you know how loud the end times are going to be spiritually? There's a word God gave Sister Jean this morning and the, and the word that God gave Sister Jean and God gave a very similar word to Sister Shanta. It was the Lord says, this is a day of breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And I'm releasing breakthrough in this house. Yeah. But the noise is so loud. What kind of noise? The cares of the world. What kind of noise? What we're hearing in our head. What kind of noise? The things that are being said. What we're saying. And the Lord says, I want you to get through the noise and into the breakthrough. See, the enemy at the end of the age is going to try to wear you out so you can't think, you can't function, you can't read the word without battling confusion. He'll bring family against you, friends against you, co-workers against you. He'll try to bring people in your own church against you. And the, and the word says he's just trying to wear God's people out. So how do you know that God's revealing that strategy, that schema of the enemy? And we've got to understand it. So, Pastor, what happens when that attack comes and, and I don't know what to do and I'm tired and I'm worn out and I'm weary? Get in the secret place! Yes, amen. you got to go to the rock. Amen. When you're feeling like that, you got to get in the secret place and shut the door and, and set a lighting to whatever you and Jesus like. And get in the presence and get in worship and hear his voice. And do not leave until you touch the hem of his garments. You receive that? And then, by the way, repeat daily. Amen? Not ever, ever read, you know, rinse and repeat daily? Okay, this is what we need to do with the Lord. Amen? And, and I find something interesting in Daniel 7.25 because the word refers to God as most high. Anybody notice that? The most high God. The Most High God. Do you know in Hebrew, that's the term for God, El Elyon. And you know what it literally means? The God Most High that rules over the kingdom of men, the Lord of heaven and earth. Whoa. So what do I need to say when, when the mental and physical and emotional attack is coming? You are El Elyon! You're the God of heaven and earth! You rule over the affairs of man! And no matter what he says, I can stand firm in you. Amen. Do you receive that in the Lord this morning? Amen. Now it's interesting where the word says in Galatians chapter 1, someone caught in sin or a fault in the King James Version. Do you know what that means? 
In the Greek, sin or fault can mean an offense, a willful sin, a trespass, or a failure. So when the Lord says Galatians 6.1, when somebody's caught in sin, do you know it can simply mean somebody in the church that's offended? And the Lord says they need to be restored. The word says, do not let a root of bitterness spring forth among you and therefore, and therefore defile many. So what, 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 what does that mean? Well, let, let, let me give you an example. And, and I'm not picking on anybody in the room, but this just happens in churches. It's not happening here in Jesus' name. But Denise, can you believe Pastor? I can't believe Pastor said that. You know, I can't believe he was preaching on that stuff. He was preaching just at me. Uh -huh. He was looking outside my house. He knew exactly what I was doing. He was preaching just at me. Can you believe he does that? You know, I, I don't know if he walks in the anointing that he used to walk in anymore. I mean, there's something going on with Pastor. Okay, that's where Denise has got to go, whoa, 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 brother. You've got an offense. Let me help you with that. And by the way, not responding back is as much as agreement. Going, oh, 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 oh. See, is anybody getting that? And then one person's defiled, and then another person becomes defiled through it. Really? He did that? I can't believe that. I thought the other night I saw his truck parked out in front of such and such a bar. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. And look, he doesn't seem as close as Miss Holly anymore either. Uh-huh. Oh, we better call people to pray about this, sister. We better call people to start praying. Yeah, but it's not a prayer request. It's pastor. And all of a sudden now... We become people that were once in unity. Now we're in puddles of opinion and offense. And that's how the enemy breaks churches. That's how the enemy splits things. And so the word says a brother caught in sin, it can simply mean an offense. Because an offense is as dangerous as a fall. Because an offense is a fall waiting to happen. That's for all of us, including me. How many received that in the Lord? So, so we, we've got to we've got to understand that. How many received that in the Lord? Yeah. And, and it's interesting because the word says in James chapter five and verse sixteen, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do you know it's something that's interesting that that the word says? So notice the screen. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be what? Yeah. That you may be rothod. What is rafa? Healing and restoration. Do you want to know what can hold back our healing? Not being honest about the faults in our own lives. And judging people based upon the faults. Because at times I've found people in the church, Pastor, I can't believe so-and-so. And, -so, and I'm not going to talk about anybody in the room. Pastor, I'm I can't believe so-and-so. They blah, 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 blah. And so I'll go in and, and try to help that person to find out the very person that came to me has the same issue. And what we find at times with people is if I have the issue and someone else in the body has issues, that same issue, if I draw attention to them, it takes the heat off me. Or sometimes we don't like in another person the same thing that's in them that we battle. I just don't like that person. No, there's a spiritual thing going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about anybody in the room. I've, I've screwed up in church, guys. I've seen it happen. And I understand. I think sometimes healing is blocked because we're not honest about our own faults. And if we're not honest about them, then we're not letting God heal them. And sometimes I think whatever we're walking in allows the sickness in our body. Well, give me an example, Pastor, of judgment. Mm -hmm. If we have a judgmental spirit, um, let's say offense. We have an offended spirit. Let's say uh, reje rejection. We have a spirit of rejection that we're walking in. If we won't let God deal with that and won't be honest with it, and sometimes God deals with it when we're just honest with somebody and pray for each other, put that out there and be real. God bless our Catholic brothers and sisters that at least understand the concept of confession. Okay? And that's where they, the Catholics get this from, confessing your sins one to another. But you go to the priest, well, you know what? We're all royal priesthood. And wouldn't it be great in this body and everybody, if you're struggling with some, someone, that you could have someone in the body to go to and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Can you pray for me? Yeah, I'd love to pray for you. And no, it's not going to go anywhere else. 
And in the confession and in the prayer and in the repentance, God says healing can come, not just emotionally and mentally, but also physically and supernaturally, spiritually. How many are receiving this? I think sometimes as God, we're too, with God, we're too internal. And sometimes with God's people, we're too external. Um, and that's an interesting comment I just made, but I think it's something to kind of think through and, and you'll understand what I feel like Holy Spirit is saying through that. So let me ask you a question. How many people in the body of Christ today sitting in Mother's Day services in their wonderful hats and Mother's Day outfits and all this stuff? How many people do you think deal with hurt? Shame. They've been harmed. They've been offended. They're caught in sin. They deal with tormentors. They hear lies in their head. They've got spiritual, mental, emotional pain. They're dealing with an addiction. How many people do you think are that way in the body of Christ? Okay, if you say all, and I think we all agree with that, the church needs the ministry of salvation, deliverance, and restoration. That's a crucial end times ministry. How many receive that? Amen. And not just look at people and go, man, that person is a hot mess. <laughs> But look at that person and go, there's an opportunity to minister to this person. They need some healing. They need some deliverance. They need some restoration. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. You know, I've met people in, in deliverance ministry that somebody walks in the church that really needs healing and deliverance. And in the deliverance team kind of looks at them like this. How many know that doesn't bring people to deliverance? That sends them out the door. Right? We see what we see, and there's a lot of discerning people in this house. We can't let what we discern block our heart from loving. Because Jesus loved Legion when he came naked and cut and in a mess out of those tombs. He loved him, and Legion became a revivalist in the Decapolis when the Lord was done with him. How many are receiving what the Lord said? And this is completely going where I didn't know the Lord was going to take this. So, hallelujah. How many received that? Amen. So, what is the church supposed to be? A place of help and not hurt. That's the heart of the Lord. Heart of the Lord. That's why Paul says, you who are spiritual, restore. Can I hear an amen? amen? You who are spiritual, restore. So what do spiritual people do? They do things according to the word of God, led by the spirit of God. I, I don't think you heard me. What do spiritual people do? They do things based upon the word of God is led by the spirit of God and the spirit of God will never contradict the word of God because the word and the spirit are one. Yes. How many just received this in the Lord? Yes. Amen. Now it's interesting because that word in the Greek, that word restore, it literally means to set a bone, to mend a net, to bring factions together. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? So I want you to get the picture in the Greek here. When Paul says, you who are spiritual should restore, the very first picture is a broken bone. What happens to that broken bone if it's not set so it can heal properly? It will never be right again. And it will break and it will break and it will be in pain. So when you break a bone, unless the Lord heals you supernaturally on the spot, and the Lord does those things, you go to the emergency room or wherever it is, they set the bone and then they cast it so it can heal. Mm -hmm. Do you know what happens to the bone where the break was? It heals stronger than the unbroken area around it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what God's saying about <laughs> restoration? If we will meet people in the highways and the byways and they come in here and we have the heart of Jesus towards them and take them through the process of restoration led by the word of God and the spirit of God, that area that was a mess in them will become stronger, more powerful, more incredible than the other parts that were okay when they came in. Anybody getting this? God says, I'm going to take a weakness and make it a success. God says, I'm going to take the broken part and bring breakthrough. Is anybody getting this? See, if we really see the way that God means for restoration to be in the church, we go, whoa, he's the God of restoration. Amen. Not just for me, but for every legion that I meet. Amen. Not just for me, but for every hurting person I meet. Not just for me, but for every broken person I meet. 
And I'm telling you guys, the ministry of restoration is going to be one of the most powerful ministries in the end times church. But again, I want to warn us at the end of chapter 6 and verse 1 that if we don't watch ourselves, we may also be tempted. Why? Because Hebrews 8, 12, the word says, For I will forgive their sins and trespasses and remember them no more. Wait a minute now. Hebrews 8, 12. I will forgive their sins and trespasses and I will remember them no more. Who is the I? And I will forgive their sins and trespasses or their wickedness. I will remember their sins no more. Who is the I speaking there? The Lord. Okay, if you're going to hear a few things in this word, this is one of them that I want you to hear. God wants the ministry of restoration to be one of the most powerful ministries in the end times church. Because we're going to meet a lot of broken, hurted, wounding, discarded, unloved, legion-like people. How many receive that? Okay. If God forgives sins and unrighteousness and iniquity and remembers them no more, what happens if we, have the, as the people of God, remember people's sins? Mm. Let me say this in love. We're opening up the door for the tormentors. So you know what the Lord is saying to the church? Don't talk about it when I've forgiven it. And don't bring up what I've forgotten. Let me put it this way. Don't go fishing in the sea of forgetfulness. So when that person is healed and restored, God said, I don't want this brought up again. I've forgotten it and I want you to forget it. How many receive this in the Lord? Amen. Amen. So we just need to keep this in mind. So in that ministry of restoration, healing, and deliverance in the church, that's really, I believe God's going to bring that to the forefront here in this body. Amen. We need to understand we can't judge those that are being restored. We have to love them and forgive them, remembering that we too are human and susceptible to sin. Is anybody receiving what the Lord is saying? Yes. So we've got to understand that. And judgment can cause us to have to face the same test. I think some of us caught that. <laughs> judgment can cause us to have to face the same test. Amen. I knew a pastor in the area that had an emotional affair with a woman on his leadership team. Emotional. It never went physical. It went emotional. But how many know an affair is an affair? Mm -hmm. Because an affair is when we give someone else what rightfully belongs to our spouse. That's also why God called Israel adulteress. He said, you have given what rightfully belongs to me to idols. Your love, your worship, your attention, your focus. Is anybody catching this? So this pastor had an emotional affair with a woman on his leadership team. He got exposed. He repented before the church. And the senior pastor of the church just gave him the hardest time. I mean, just rode the rails with this guy. True story that hit close to home, not me. Um, true, but I saw it happen. And uh, the senior pastor was so hard on this guy, he basically ran him out of the church. Until five years later, that senior pastor had a full-blown affair with a woman in the church. I believe spiritual boomerang happens. Because that pastor was so judgmental and unforgiving and rode the other pastor so hard, instead of helping lead him through restoration, that judgment manifested in that pastor's life. And what this man did partially, he did fully, and he lost his church over it and his ministry. Folks, that's how bad this can get. Look at King Saul. King Saul judges and obsesses over David to the point that what happens to King Saul, an evil spirit now has ground to come in and torment him. And the very one he's offended over, angry over, obsessed with, has to come and use his anointing so the demon will leave. Whoa. Tell me that's not a hardcore truth in the word of God that we need to keep in mind. So God says, I want your first response to be love because the Lord says, I'm the judge. And I'll lead you in this process. My heart is not condemnation, it's restoration. 
Does this make sense? And by the way, if that's for other people, that's for us too. And God says, for some of us, I want to teach you how to forgive yourself. Yes, amen. Because sometimes in the church, people judge because they can't even forgive themselves for their son. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. Sometimes we judge in the church because we have a hard time even forgiving ourselves. And if we can't forgive ourselves, how do we forgive anyone else? And that opens up the door to torment. Okay. So this is going to be a strong word that the Lord's about to release to the group. But it's just a word of alignment. And it's a word that hit me between the eyes too. Um, the Lord is basically saying in this hour... That if we're not submitted to him and we're not doing things his way, then we're not really his. That's a tough word. But what the Lord is saying to us is now is the hour to not just say we love him. He said, if you love me, you'll do what I say. And to couple love with obedience because that's the sign that we're truly his. And so if God says restore gently and in love and all we want to do is judge and not help people get out of these situations and grow and get set free, are we really? Yes. And the Lord says, I want the church to be all mine. A fellow comes up to Jesus in his earthly ministry and he says to him, Lord, Lord. And the Lord turns around and looks at him and says, why do you call me Lord when you don't do what I say? It's the same word, just spoken differently. And the Lord is saying to the church, I want you to be mine. If you're mine, you're going to do things my way. And when we get in the secret place, that's going to bring alignment between us and God. Because going in the secret place is like going to the chiropractor. The Lord says, I'm going to get you in the secret place in my power, my glory, and my anointing. And pop, 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 pop. I'm going to pop things back into alignment in your spiritual spine. And you're going to kind of go in like this. And you're going to come out like this. Hallelujah. But we've got to realize the converse of that is true. If we aren't willing to go in the secret place and get lost in his presence, we're going to be in a place of misalignment. And how many know we don't want to, we don't want to be in that place? Amen. Amen. And God says, I, I want you to remember this. I said, I'm going to restore back to you the years the locusts and cankerworm have eaten. Don't need to raise a hand, but how many here haven't lost days? Haven't lost months? How many here have lost years? The Lord says, I'm restoring back to you the years the locusts and cankerworm have eaten. Which is why I'm going to say it again. Silver-haired saints are saints that are covering the silver. God wants you to know this. Your greatest ministry is yet ahead because he's, he says, I'm going to restore the years back to you. And in your prayer time, I want you to remind the Lord that he said, Joel chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, I'm going to restore the years back to you that the locusts and the cankerworm have eaten because the word of God loves it when we petition him with the word of God. Because when you petition the Lord with His own word, you're speaking His language. Yes, amen. Is anybody getting this? Amen. That's why we've got to incorporate the word of God into our prayer time. Because when we petition God with His own word, it moves Him. He is moved by Himself. Yes, Come on. It'd be like one of my kids going up to me and saying, Well, Dad, you know, your heart is this. You've been saying this. Dad, this is what you said. Then what, what do you say to that? Mm -hmm. I need to be consistent. Now, we don't have to remind the Lord. The Lord knows, but he loves it when we speak his language. Mm -hmm. And the word is his language. Promises are his language. How many get this? And we need to speak the Lord the way that you know he wants us to speak to him. How many know that God says, I want to pour out upon you an anointing of shalom? You hear me pray that over you, right? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and fill you with shalom. Okay? Shalom ties in with restoration. That's a Hebrew word. You know what shalom means? Happiness, prosperity, and peace. Oh. So I go to Sister Shanta and I say, shalom. 
I'm saying happiness, prosperity, and the peace of the Lord be upon you. Amen. How many know shalom is a blessing? Amen. That's why if we were in a synagogue this morning, we'd see people and say shalom. Mm -hmm. Or ma shalom or ma shalek. Mm -hmm. It depends. We're speaking a threefold blessing of the Lord over them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to say this in love. God says there's some things that we're going through right now and that we're coming into that we just, just need to speak shalom over. Amen. And not a whole lot of other stuff. Right. There's some people that, that, that may be letting the Lord move through them, not in this house, but the Lord may want us to speak shalom over that. Because when we speak shalom, that lets the Lord come in and deal with the situation. Ephesians right. yeah. yeah. 6, we've got a lot against flesh and blood. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Now, it's interesting that I've heard people teach on shalom, but I've never heard them teach on any variants of shalom. Because every Hebrew word is going to have a root to it. And sometimes more than one word comes off the root. Are you ready for this? Shalom, this word that we use all the time, comes from the same root as another word that we don't use much in the church at all. It's shalom. And I think sometimes people don't study shalom because it sounds like it's part of another religion. But it's really not. Shalom and shalom are cousins in the Hebrew. Are you ready for this? Shalom means happiness, prosperity, and peace. Amen? Do you know what shalom means? To amend, to finish, to make good again, to make safe. Do you know restoration is God shalaming you? Okay, what does shalom mean? And I'm going to say it again. To amend, to finish, to make good again, to be saved. So you know what we can do? We can pray. God, I ask you to shalom this situation between my brother and I. God, I ask you to shalom this situation in my marriage. God, I ask you to shalom this situation between this church and that church. Lord, I ask you to shalom this situation going on at work. Whoa. See, when you do that, you're saying, God, I give you this fight. I give you the outcome. I give you this whole thing so that you can come in and do the work. But if instead I go charge it up and start dealing with it, God goes, okay, he's got it. He's got it. But when we ask God to shalom it, we're putting it in God's hands. And how you know God can deal with it better than we can? Yes. <laughs> Somebody comes in that's legion and we're praying and we're working with them and the battle's really hard. God, I need you to shalom this situation. Mm -hmm. We're speaking the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. I believe Hebrew is the language of heaven. Please love me as I say that. Mm -hmm. Shalom to amend, to finish, to make good again, to make safe. How many receive that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now are you ready for this? When God shaloms you, he amends in you what the enemy has tried to do to you for a long time. When God restores back to you the years the locusts have eaten, God says, I'm shalaming you. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Not shalaming. I'm shalaming you. How many receive that? You see, I think a lot of times the enemy has tried to treat to keep the true Hebrew away from the Western the Western Church. And how many God, how many know God is just really beginning to reveal some things we've never known before? So here's the thing. Remember the brother that's overtaken in sin, and the word says that that sin just kind of blindsided them. You know what God says is about to happen to you? He says, my shalom is about to blindside you. The Lord said out of nowhere, shalom! And God's going to bring a sudden restoration and healing and, and finishing and making good again and increasing you. God says, I'm just going to shalom you. Just as the enemy, boom, 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 boom. God says, I'm going to shalom, 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 shalom in your life in multiple areas. And you're going to be amazed at what I'm about to do. How many received that? Yes. And it's kind of like Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. The Lord says, I'm going to take what the enemy has meant for evil and I'm going to turn it around for good for your life. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to receive that. Yes. Amen. Amen. So when God begins to release this anointing of shalom in your life, he begins overturning what the enemy has done. Amen. How many received that? Amen. 
Amen. Amen. See, we, we, we've got to understand that. Why? Because God's heart is to heal. God's heart is to restore. God's heart is to deliver. God's heart is to make things right. God's heart is to take that which is disjointed and joint it again properly or join it again properly. How many received that? Yeah. Now, this shalaming thing, guys, I don't think I can preach enough on this for us to really begin to understand it. I think the way God really wants us to get it. So I want to encourage you to take to Holy Spirit what he's saying with this. But the woman with the issue of blood, she'd suffered with the issue of blood for how many years? Twelve. Twelve years. It's very interesting. Twelve is a number of completion and government in the Hebrew. Twelve years this lady had suffered. Do you know for twelve years she couldn't go in the temple because she was unclean? So the sickness not only wreaked havoc in her body, she couldn't, she couldn't go to synagogue anymore. Is anybody catching this? She was cut off from the house of God because of this. So 12 years in, she spent all her finances, all of her wealth, everything, and she's destitute. And the word of God said that she heard that Jesus was there and she pressed through the crowds and laid a hold of the hem of his garment. Yes. Now, they really believed because she was a woman, the men weren't going to let her go through the crowd. So they believed she got on her knees and pressed through to get to Jesus. And they don't believe she touched the hem of his garment. That touching the hem of the garment, literally going to Greek and then the Hebrew, basically would state she kissed the talit of his garment. So the talit hung down. And they believe when, when prophet, priests, and kings were anointed, priests especially, the oil would go down and saturate that tallit that hung down. And the word literally says she kissed his tallit. And you know what happened? What she had battled for 12 years nonstop, God shalomed it in a moment. God says, I'm about to shalom in a moment what you've battled with for years. Mindsets, generational curses, familiar spirits, things following the family line. God says, I'm going to bring a quick turnaround. I'm going to bring an anointing of shalom to amend, to finish, to make good again, and to make safe. God says, I'm the righteous judge, and I'm saying, no more! Because I see the heart and I'm restoring healing. Mm -hmm. How many received that? But if we're going to walk in that, we've got to be able to receive God's forgiveness for our lives and to forgive others because unforgiveness and judgment, bitterness, all of this blocks the shalaming of God. It will block the shalaming of God. Now, you've heard me talk about William H. Branham and opinions vary on him, but God gave this guy a worldwide prophetic ministry. Mm -hmm. He was in a church one time ministering, and he was ministering to this lady that was well-known in the church. Her life was well-known in the church. Is anybody getting this? Mm -hmm. Okay, she was the woman caught in adultery. Her life was well-known. And William H. Branham in a huge healing line is ministering to her and God just touched her and shalabs her and heals her. I mean, God does a miraculous work. And afterwards, the pastor comes up to Branham and he says, so what did God tell you about her? And you know what the Lord said? Or what the Lord spoke through Branham? Branham looks at the pastor and says this, the spirit of God won't even tell the prophets something that's been covered in the blood. Whoa. See, there's something sacred when we repent and confess and give that to the Lord. And the Lord says, I forgive you. I throw it in the sea of forgetfulness. I separate as far as the east is from the west. There's something sovereign in that. We've got to understand that forgiveness is supernatural. The blood is supernatural. And if we want to open up the door for torment, start fishing in the sea of forgetfulness and bring back up against people what the Spirit of God won't even reveal to the prophets. Whoa. So I tell you what, guys, and I'm going to close with this. 
we don't ever want to open up the door for tormentors in our life. Amen. We don't want to open up the door for tormentors. Tormentors come when we say, okay, well, we can receive something in the word, but that's not for this person. They need to be punished. Or if we can't forgive ourselves, therefore we can't commit, can, can't forget, can forgive others. Or if we're walking in generational stuff, judgment and other things, all this stuff the enemy brings to block God's salaming of your life. And some of us may be in difficult situations with, with people in our families or whatever it may be, where there's just been attack, 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 oh, yeah. difficulty, difficulty, difficulty. God and the enemy wants two completely opposite things to happen there. God wants you to forgive and bless and speak shalom and be an instrument of healing. The enemy wants you to judge and get angry, right? So the enemy can now get two people with one shot. The person that's not, not only messed up, but the person now that this is now inflicted on that is judging back. The enemy goes, Shh, I've got legal rights before the throne. It's a boomerang on that one. How do you receive that? Amen. But also know when someone in the family line says, Lord, I surrender to you. I choose to forgive. I choose to release. I choose to let go. I choose to bless. I choose to speak shalom and shalom. God, I praise your holy name. That also <coughs> brings forth a boomerang. <laughs> that can go through a slot as a swap and hit multiple people. Okay. How you're seeing this in the Lord. Yes. That's why us being in the right position that we're supposed to be in is so important for our marriage, our family, our church. This is so important that we're walking in the right place and when God brings legion around the corner, we can love legion into the kingdom. And in deliverance and healing, because Legion might be the greatest evangelist that ever came out of this house. Amen. The greatest prophet. Who knows? So God says, I want you to get in alignment with me. I want you to understand that I'm the God of restoration. I am Jehovah Rapha. I heal you and I restore you. And as I heal you and restore you, I want you to become an instrument of healing and restoration to pour that out on others. There's not a thing that God is giving you that he doesn't want to pour through you onto others. God's giving you healing. He wants to use you as an instrument of healing to others. God's delivering you. He wants to help use you to deliver others. God's blessing you. He says, I want you to bless others with what I give you. God's giving you revelation. He says, I want you to pour out that revelation on other people. How many are getting this? You're going to the secret placing in the presence of God. God says, pour out that oil. Pray over others. But God says, you've got to be in the secret place receiving so that you can pour out. You've got to be in the secret place receiving so that you can pour out. The Lord says the enemy either wants to get you through getting disjointed, angry, upset, bitter. If he can't get you there, then he wants to Daniel 7, 25 you and wear you out mentally, physically, emotionally. I mean, there's just a series of things he wants to do to the people of God right now. Why? Why more than any other time in history? Because the church is about to rise up in power and anointing and authority through intimacy. And the greatest days of the church are yet ahead. Which is also why the demonic hordes have been poured out on the earth greater than ever before at this point in history. That's why the casual Christian is not going to survive what's coming. Mm -hmm. only the intimate Christian is going to survive what's coming. Mm -hmm. Intimacy is going to be the key to survival. You watch. Those that are not willing to press into intimacy and to love Jesus and, and go after him with all their heart are going to be living out Matthew 23 and 24 and their love will wax cold and they're going to fall away. Mm -hmm. And this is what's going to happen to many. By the time they wake up when all these difficult things are going to happen, they're going to go from wake up to I've got to try to rapidly catch up. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be easy. The Lord says, that's why he says, I'm catching you up now to what's about to happen. I'm preparing you for what's about to take place. So if a nuclear attack hits the East Coast, can we stay in Shalom? 
If an earthquake comes through the Midwest, can we stay in Shalom? Can we witness these things and go, you know what? The Lord is coming back soon. The great harvest is upon us. What are we going to do, God? Or will we experience that and go, what are we going to do, God? See, he's preparing you in the secret place right now for what's about to happen. Is anybody getting this? Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, when all this happens, people are going to stream in the church and they're going, what is going on? What's happening? What's going on in the world around me? And that's where we've got to be here and ready in the ministry of salvation, deliverance, and restoration to say, Jesus is what's happening. And guys, there's times coming where people will come through the door 24-7. We're going to take shifts in the house of God. Because people are just going to start coming, 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 coming. And a shift is going to come in to release another shift. And they're going to be, how many got saved in, in your shift? A hundred? Wow. Wow. What happened? Well, this many got delivered and this many healed. I mean, God just says that people are just coming in, coming in, coming in. When my dad was here for our Seder service, he said, son, he said, during the service, I saw this room, standing room only. People are here and hungry and going after God. Amen. Now, my first response was, Woohoo! My second response was, What's going to drive them in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, after 9 11, people streamed into the church for two weeks, three weeks. The church wasn't ready. The church wasn't ready to go, Do you know what just happened? Let me tell you why it happened. The church wasn't ready. People came in for two or three weeks, gone. The Lord says, I want my church to be ready this time and to be a people of salvation, deliverance, and restoration. And right now, God's calling people out of messes. And he's saving, restoring, delivering, restoring, because he's going to use them mightily in the time that's coming. That's why we're about to see God pull people out of some stuff that some of us have been praying for them for a long time. When their head comes up out of the stuff and they come around the foyer, we don't want to go, well, it's about time. What did you do? Just mess up so bad this time that you just had to come to church? No, that's where we got to go. Hallelujah. Welcome. Welcome. But see, we can only pour out what's in our hearts. And if our hearts are anger, judgment, bitterness, that's all we can give them when they come in. But if our heart is full of Jesus and intimacy and joy, come on in. I'm so excited you're here. I've got a, co a cousin, a female cousin I prayed for for years. Every day on the way to work, Lord, draw her to you. Touch her. Father, draw her to Jesus. I found out just a few weeks ago she got saved. Hallelujah. She was a pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. Oh, girl got saved. I prayed for her for years. She got saved in her mid fifties. Girl got saved, grew up around the things of God, so familiar with the God she didn't know. Yes. And girl got saved, and, and my uncle told my dad that he went to her apartment, and the apartment's completely different now. Yes. The presence of God is there. Yes. Yes. Folks, we're about to see a harvest, and people you've been praying for are about to get saved and delivered and healed, we got to make sure our heart's in the right place towards them. Because we can pray what's right, but not have the right things in our heart. So we got to pray, Lord, as I'm praying for this person, give me the right heart for that person. Lord, as I'm praying for this person, give me the right attitude towards that person. Lord, I'm, as I'm praying for this person, God, prepare me for when they respond to this prayer. If you're praying for your worst enemy and your worst enemy came through the door to get saved on a Sunday morning, what would our response be? The Lord wants it to be, hallelujah, I'm going to rejoice with the angels. God has restored me and I know he's going to do the same thing for you. Welcome. Folks, mark these words with this word that God released today. First comes the knowledge, then comes the test. And I believe God is going to begin salaming people in this room. But as he does this, keep this in mind. He's then going to begin to do it in the lives of people all around you. Prepare your heart to receive the shalaming 
and to pour it out on other people. Because you're not receiving just for you. Freely as you've been given, freely give. So get ready. He's shalaming you so you can pour it out on others and maybe on some others that God might have to work on a little bit to, in you to pour that out on them, right? Get ready. Get ready. The Lord right now is trying to deal with anything in the heart of his people that block his love. I don't know if you heard me. Right now, God's trying to deal with anything in the hearts of his people that blocks his love. Amen. Isn't that a powerful word from the Lord on this Mother's Day? Amen. And, and yes, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Here's the thing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Lord God. God released this word today because he's bringing shalom into your life. Amen. Then God's going to shalom people all around you and he wants to use you to help. Let's get ready. We got to believe God can do it for us and then if God does it to us for us, then God wants to pour that out through us to others. Yes. Amen. And if we'll be willing to do that, enemies can become friends. <laughs> Folks we've been disjointed with can become fellow warriors standing next to us. Yeah. You know, I went through when I went through a difficult time with Hannah's mom. The Lord told me, He said, You're going to be able to show her my love more now than in previous years. And at first, my heart went, <laughs> I'm being honest. <laughs> And then God had to deal with that in me. And as he dealt with that in me, and I began to realize what God was really saying, then God gave me those opportunities to do that very thing. And I remember, yes, and, and I remember very much thinking, that God, there's a lot of people you could release that through. And the Lord said, yeah, but it's going to be received from you. And she's going to see Jesus in you. Andrew, what's more important, the anger and the unforgiveness or letting me use you and pour myself out through you? And the Lord said, if you stay here, Andrew, you're going to die spiritually because the anointing is going to grind to a halt in your life. I went, whoa. God only speaks like that when he wants to bring us into a really intimate place and there's some stuff he wants to burn up or drown. But didn't he say today in Isaiah 43, you'll go through the flood waters, but you won't be drowned. You'll go through the fire, but you won't be burned. But you'll come out of that not holding on to as much as you were before. How many receive that? Yes. You receive that. Let's just close our eyes for a moment in the Lord. Hallelujah. And Pastor Cindy's just going to put something on for us here real quick. I know it's Mother's Day. And folks probably have gatherings to go to. But you know what? On a day like this, we'd rather have a roast burn than you burn. You know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. So it, it's a good day to let God just take us into some follow through with what was just spoken. So I want us to take just a moment. And if there's anyone here that needs to forgive anyone, that needs to let go of the past, that needs to let go of hurt, I want to encourage you to do that right now. Also, if there's anyone in this room that's going, God, I, I hear pastor preaching, you're the God of restoration. I'm struggling receiving that. Lord, give me a breakthrough. Pray that right now. Lord, I ask you to shalom me. I ask you to heal and restore. I just decree and declare right now, Lord God, that you are Jehovah Rapha. Lord, I need your healing and your restoration. Lord, I need your healing and your restoration. Lord, I need your healing and your restoration. And then, Lord, I want to pour it out on others. Lord, I want to pour it out on other people. Lord, I don't want anything in my life that blocks your love. God, I don't want anything in my life that blocks your love. 
Lord, I don't want anything in my life that blocks the anointing. Lord, I just let it go. Lord, I just let it go. Lord, I trust you. Lord, the things that I'm holding on to that are hindering and eating away and causing issues. Lord Jesus, I just give those things to you right now. Some of us may need to give some people to the Lord. Because Lord, you know right now that's coming through this person. I'm experiencing this with this person. Lord, I need your help with that. I give this person to you. One of the most powerful prayers we can pray is, Lord, I forgive this person and I bless them. And Lord, I ask you to do the same thing. Even if they never apologize to me, even if they never try to get it right, I forgive them and I bless them. In Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we just need you right now. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would remove from this room anything that hinders you, anything that hinders love. Lord, anything, God, that blocks you, Lord, I just ask that you would remove it because, Lord, we need you more than ever before. Lord Jesus, as the days are about to grow darker, Lord God, as things are going to happen that are going to shake the earth, and the heavens in some cases, Lord, your word says. God, help us be ready because we've pressed in. We've heard your voice and the spirit of God has told us what's coming. Lord, prepare us and anoint us to walk in shalom and shalom in the days that lie ahead. And Lord, I thank you that even people in this room, Lord, coming into an understanding through what was taught today, Lord, even people in this room saying, I forgive and God use me to bless people that have hurt me. God, that's opening up the door for you to set up divine appointments. God, it's setting up the door for them to bump into that person they haven't seen for 10 years. God, it's opening up the door for you to make things happen. And Lord, it's also releasing a holy boomerang that can cut a mighty swath and allow you to move in ways that, Lord, unforgiveness and bitterness is hindered for years. Lord Jesus, now in your name, I plead your blood, your shalom, and your shalom over this entire group. In Jesus' name. Lord, I speak that over everyone that's listening in right now, Lord God. Our church family, our virtual family, Lord, I just bless them in your name right now. And Lord, I pray on this Mother's Day, may everything begin to change. May everything begin to change in the right, right direction for this house. Lord, we ask that you would restore back to this house what the locusts have eaten, what the canker worm have eaten, what the enemy has stolen. Lord, we ask that you would bring that restoration over this house. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would release that anointing of restoration, that ha, 
that complete healing, restoration, and abundance better than it was before over this house. Lord, I ask this for this house and for everyone that makes up this house. I speak a shift into Shalom in the name of Jesus. I speak a shift into Shalom in the name of Jesus. Lord, it's done. Lord, I just sense it's done in you. Lord, I pray now, may you bless and keep this group on this Mother's Day. May you make your face to shine upon them and be gracious unto them. May you turn your countenance towards them and fill them with shalom and shalom. And the people of the Lord said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. This The size of this group has exceeded my expectations for Mother's Day. You guys have blessed me for coming to the house of the Lord on this day. If you're going to Mother's Day celebrations afterwards, I want to encourage you to go and bring the presence of God with you, the power of God with you, the anointing of God with you, and bring shalom and shalom with you to that celebration in Jesus' name. God bless you. Yes, ma'am, I see a hand up. Ladies, take a bag. Mother's Day gift. All right, so mamas, look, there are bags back there, hot pink for Mother's Day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Make sure you take, take a bag with you. If you're going to see a mom, take a bag for her, because I think we're going to have plenty of bags. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you for coming.